Brothers and sisters in Islam, to my non-Muslim brothers and sisters in humanity, to my dear brothers and sisters at Salam Media in South Africa, I am very, very uh, pleased and honored to be able to join you today with a couple of special guests uh, for this, uh, this edition of A Conversation with El Hajj Maurice Alakan. Let me begin with the uh, a little background uh, information on uh, our, our sisters, our special guests for the day. Uh, after I uh, give you a little teaser on 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 the issues that we're going to be discussing today, it's going to be a part of the conversation. Uh, inshallah, Taala, there are going to be three uh, really core issues that we're going to be discussing. The first is going to be, of course, uh, the, the national police-related disturbances uh, that are raging in the United States right now and the history of policing in the African-American community. We're going to be talking about also, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. It has been moved off the front consciousness of our communities because of these disturbances, but you know, the pandemic is still raging and its impact on the African American and Muslim communities is still being felt as well as on other communities as well. But disproportionately is being felt on African American communities. And the reasons for that are also connected to the reasons why we also have this, this uh, social, political, cultural pandemic uh, man-made uh, in the form of, of, of police misconduct and, and uh, this need for police reform. And then thirdly, we want to get our sisters' perspective on the challenges and opportunities confronting Muslims in America. Uh, given our size, our diversity, our material capacity, and the unique mission that we have as a faith community. Um, but before we get into these areas of concern, I want to share some information about the two sisters uh, that are going to be gracing our platform this afternoon by the grace of Allah. First, our sister Aisha al Adawiya. Our sister Aisha out of New York City, she's based in the Big Apple, is the founder and chair of Women in Islam, Inc an organization of Muslim women which focuses on human rights and social justice. Our sister organizes and participates in conferences, symposia, and other forums on Islam, gender equity, conflict resolution, cult cross-cultural understanding, and peace building. She also, she also represents Muslim women's non-governmental organizations at United Nations forums. Uh, our sister Aisha coordinates Islamic input for the preservation of the Black Religious Heritage Documentation Project um, at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, a very important institution. She also serves as a consultant to numerous interfaith organizations and documentary projects on the Muslim American experience. Additionally, she serves on the boards of numerous organizations related to the interests of the global Islamic community. Our other Aisha, our sister Aisha Prime, embraced Islam more than 20 years ago after being a youth ambassador to Morocco and Senegal. There she developed a thirst for knowledge that would lead her to sit at the feet and learn from some of the top Islamic scholars of our time. After having participated in several circles of knowledge in the U.S., uh, Aisha uh, decided to pursue religious studies abroad. She studied Arabic and Quran at the Fajr Institute in Cairo, Egypt. Later, she moved to Hadramaut, Yemen, and enrolled in Dar al-Zahra, uh, an Islamic university for women. There, she studied Akida, uh, Quran, Hadith, Arabic, jurisprudence uh, uh, or fiqh, Islamic law, purification of the heart, 
and other religious disciplines. She has received several scholarly ijaza or licenses enabling her to teach. Uh, the work that she is most committed to and that she enjoys the most uh, have been the development of Islamic programming, Islamic studies curriculum, and rites of passage programs for youth and adults. The majority of her life uh, has been spent as an educator and activist. She is most passionate about combining Islamic studies, cultural art, activism, and service for the purpose of training leaders to rise above whatever challenges stand in their way and that of the community they serve. She currently serves as scholar in residence and associate chaplain at the Islamic Center of New York University and as women's program director at Dar al-Hijra Islamic Center in Falls Church, Virginia. In addition to her full-time work, she is the co-founder and executive director of Baraka Inc., an organization committed to training Muslim women in traditional Islamic sciences with a focus on modern application. Sister Aisha is recently known for her participation in the National Women's March and the courses she teaches on traditional knowledge, the challenges of race and gender and spirituality in the Muslim community. Our sister Aisha a Prime is a proud wife and a mother of three, no doubt, outstanding children. I want to welcome both of our sisters uh, to this week's edition of a conversation with El Hajj Maurice Salah Khan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa Alhamdulillah. You don't know how much this fills me with 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 joy i mean just sheer joy having you two sisters uh, uh as my guests for this week's program during a very very tumultuous period in our nation's history uh alhamdulillah it's uh let me begin let me begin with my <laughs> sister aisha yeah. aisha el adawiya um, from new york city the big apple where it has become a, a double epicenter, <laughs> subhanAllah, uh, of the uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic. And it has also become somewhat of an epicenter for much of the turbulence taking place here in America right now. A lot of drama taking place in your city, sister, around this, uh, uh, this, this concern, this rising and legitimately placed concern for uh, around police misconduct, the need for police reform, uh, the relationship that police, uh, uh, the police establishment on the local level, the state level, the federal level have had with the African American community, uh, and uh, you know the consequent uh, call now for uh, long overdue reform. Given the the, the Given where you work, where you where you have been uh, in const for so many years, uh, in one of the leading institutes uh, uh, providing uh, uh, education in the area of history, uh, what are your thoughts on what you're seeing right now vis-a-vis -vis what uh, the relationship has been uh, with policing in the African American community going all the way back to the founding of this uh, potentially great but deeply disturbed nation called America. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts, sister. Well, Assalamu alaikum, dear brother. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you and my sister Aisha uh, Prime. Um, well, uh, it's a very long story, and we only have one hour. <laughs> so, <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> so I'll try to be brief, uh, but I'll start out by saying that my role uh, at the Schomburg Center uh, has been uh, a blessing uh, because it has uh, given me the opportunity uh, to, in addition to being a community activist, uh, and uh, it, it has given me uh, the wherewithal to get uh, scholarly information and contributions and input on this story about uh, policing in the United States as it uh, uh, 
uh, impacts uh, the uh, African American community. Uh, so uh, that that said, uh, much of my work that uh, uh, touches upon this subject is uh, not in my role specifically uh, at the Schomburg Center, although it's very important. And I'm uh, certainly sure that after this pandemic and we get back uh, into our offices, although many uh, resources are online uh, now uh, for uh, researchers uh, at the Schomburg Center, uh, we uh, have now on us uh, the necessity. It, there's always been this pressing need to know our history. And as we talk and move about in uh, particularly the uh, Muslim community, uh, the necessity of knowing our history. And this is now uh, more prevalent, more common than ever, uh, because we see a lot of our work uh, resonating in spaces where people have no idea of the history of this uh, trauma that's been in on uh, this community, the African-American community, uh, the uh, African community in diaspora for uh, centuries. And I, I like to say centuries because I want to dispel uh, the notion that this is something new that's impacting our community. I think uh, the, the, the only new things that we have is that we have smartphones now and we have technology so that we can uh, take photos and films of some of the atrocities that are happening now. And in too many instances, even when we have uh, visual images of the brutality taking place in real time, we still have to struggle very strongly and very powerfully to have our cases made and accepted as truth and fact and then reach for uh, justice in the legal system. And as you all know, uh, that is an ongoing challenge. Now, I'd like to reference very briefly uh, that uh, there's something known as the slave codes mm -hmm. in the United States. And the slave codes is really uh, the origins of policing in the United States. The slave codes mm -hmm gave uh, white people uh, the authority uh, to uh, round up, uh, catch uh, any black person, uh, any white person could do that uh, at will and uh, inflict whatever they uh, would like to do on that person uh, and in fact uh, bring them back to uh, the enslaver. Yeah, so, so, so policing uh, when we talk about reforming the police, and there have certainly been a lot of uh, reforms that have taken place over the years, we must understand the origins of policing in the United States and to know that in order to talk about uh, serious reform of this institution uh, uh, that was created to uh, uh, keep black people who were resistant to enslavement, uh, to mm -hmm. brutality, to keep them in place and, and brutalize them in unspeakable ways. Uh, so we see a lot of that unfolding now on, on the media. You know, uh, we can see it in mm -hmm. real time. Uh, we, we think of Floyd now, who was just, uh, it's, I don't even know words to, to speak about what, what the recent atrocities are. But even as we mourn this instance, there are others happening as we continue to mourn a particular person. So we're never given the relief of living as free uh, citizens in our own land that we uh, help build and create and bring you know, to this place that we now call uh, the United States. So I advocate very strongly, especially now, that mm -hmm. we learn our history, yeah? and yes. the the Schomburg Center is a very good place to begin. Uh, there, there are all kinds of resources there that people can go to. Even now in the pandemic, we're closed, but there are resources online, and we are now uh, talking about reopening 
uh, the center on a limited basis, but it is a good starting point uh, to begin mm -hmm. to educate ourselves about the history of this country, and in this case, about uh, the history of police brutality. Um, we have some sense, some idea about uh, lynching, but uh, it, it, there is a mentality, there is a culture behind uh, this kind of brutality, and we have we have to wonder why, how can a person commit these kinds of acts publicly, and and, and not recoil uh, at the slightest, you know, about uh, doing these kinds of uh, obscene things uh, to human beings. So uh, I'm I'm now focusing my uh, attention on uh, advocating and assisting in whatever I can to encourage. Uh, our people in particular, mm -hmm. uh, but people in general, uh, to take the time and research uh, the history of this country. And being on social media, doing a hearts or a thumbs up uh, is, is not sufficient, you know, right. to oppose that. Right. We have to get into communities, uh, understand what is happening in those communities, and then make sure that we contribute in uh, practical ways. Uh, so, um, yes. Okay, just be, before we, uh, before I put that same uh, question before our, our sister um, uh, Aisha uh, to, to share her thoughts on that, I, I want to run this, this, this other question by you quickly. Uh, speaking of history, um, we have the saying, that, that well-known saying for those who study history of Martin Niemöller, um, which just came to mind for me recently with what happened uh, in, in Buffalo just a couple of days ago and the controversies now around that. Um, for those who may not be familiar with um, what happened in, in, in Buffalo, New York, uh, there was a 75-year-old man, he's a Caucasian man, a 75-year-old elder, who was violently pushed to the ground. He didn't just fall, he was pushed to the ground um, uh, by police officers and left. They walked right past him after they pushed him to the ground and he remained on the ground profusely bleeding. They just continued walking. And um, two of the officers ended up, and this happened in upstate New York in Buffalo, two of the officers ended up being suspended. And the only reason why uh, in my view, they were suspended is because of tr the tremendous amount of attention and pressure on police forces nationwide right now. They were suspended. And, but as a result of that suspension, 57 members of the unit that he belonged to uh, des decided to resign from that unit, not from the police force. They're still on the police force, but they designed in protests from that unit. Uh, it, when I saw the report, it immediately brought the, um, the words of Martin Niemöller to, to mind for me. Uh, Niemöller was a Lutheran pastor arrested by the Gestapo in 1937. And this is what he memorably said. He said, quote, in Germany, they first came for the gypsies. And I didn't speak up because I wasn't a gypsy. Then they came for the Bolsheviks. And I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Bolshevik. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics. I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak up, end quote. I, I thought about that vis-a-vis uh, -vis this elder, this white elder that was part of a protest uh, to, to underscore the fact that black lives matter and also reflecting upon the fact that there are so many folk of so many different persuasions that are involved uh, in these ongoing demonstrations throughout the United States. Your thoughts on that, sis? My, 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 well, first of all, that's one of my favorite quotes and I, I, I use it a lot. Uh, because that's exactly uh, the truth, you know, as we know it. Uh, uh, this particular instance was riveting, and it points to the pathology, the culture of 
policing in the United States. Uh, and I'll stay in the United States. I could go global, but I won't right now. Um, and that is not only did they push this elder to the ground and leave him there, but when one of the policemen tried to uh, assist him, the other, mm -hmm. other policeman stopped him from doing that. Right. And he did, he, instead of insisting on uh, protecting and serving, uh, yes. he allowed himself to be dissuaded from helping this gentleman. So right. that, to me, was the most heartbreaking part of that scene. Yes, indeed. Now, my, my sister, Aisha Prime, what I want to do is I, I'd like for you to, in addition to res, you know, responding to this same, uh, uh, your, your, your thoughts on the history of, of, of uh, policing in, in, in the, in the African-American community, how it has played out for centuries, uh, leading all the way up to what we're seeing today. Uh, but also given the fact that you are someone who has traveled extensively um, you have studied abroad. Uh, I'd also like to know what your thoughts are on what we are seeing uh, in, in the way of this international response mm. to what is happening here in the United States. Your thoughts, sister. I mean, Aisha and we are so beautifully summed up for us, you know, even though we had a short time, she so beautifully summed up for us in terms of historically how we got to this place. I think what's just, if I had anything to add to that from a historical perspective, and it, it has to do with in 2007, um, right as Obama was coming into office, there was a report that was given by the FBI uh, that basically stated the amount of white nationalist or white supremacist organizations and their members who had joined the police force in mass numbers. And what's significant about that is that basically because they needed a way more or less to kind of be able to carry out their agenda um, and, and for many people to understand that one of the goals of, of white nationalism or white power movements or those who are part of white supremacist organizations is not only the harming or the maiming of African Americans, but really and truly the elimination of them. And so that combined with the militarization of the police was a, is literally a deadly combination. This is a deadly force that although you do still have many who are joining the police force throughout America, throughout different states, even though you have many who are joining because they, they wish to protect and to serve, but for the most part, you have one aspect, a very strong and prevalent aspect that is dead set on the elimination of African Americans. And then what we, what we have to look at in, in terms of the history of America and its foundational principles, and this is important to, for us to acknowledge, the foundational principles is that policing in America is not just a separate entity onto itself meaning that it is a part of a greater system of white supremacy that is based upon the structure of white, of, of white nationalism, that is based upon structural racism. And so policing, the way that policing is handled in America is an agent of that. And so, so when we look at even, for example, while, um, why they are pr policing certain areas, certain areas of town, their methodology of policing, not to mention, of course, if we were to get into the higher aspects of policing in terms of their surveillance um, of African Americans, of Muslims, of Muslim African American movements, and their, um, and their very concentrated efforts to undermine any strong, viable, thriving community that is, um, that is very much developing in a positive way, if they feel that they are organizing um, towards even, you know, uh, let me say self-sufficient gains and means, this is something that is actually looked at as a threat. And I think we, you know, we just all have to look at, even if they're very peaceful, 
right? Because we could look at the likes of Martin Luther King, for example, and that today we wave the flag of Dr. Martin Luther King as someone very peaceful, you know, but in reality, the, the America looked at Dr. Martin Luther King as a national threat. He was a threat to national security, right? Sorry. And they did everything to, um, to police, to undermine even his movement. And so we find the same thing occurring inside of every single even positive, peaceful, productive African-American movement of productivity, as well as within the Muslim community. And when those two things combine, you have a deadly combination. And so what we're, you know, what, what, what I really appreciate, as you mentioned, is you, we're able to see that this is a new day in history. It's a new day in history where literally this morning I was on a conversation, I was in a conversation in Australia about what's happening to African Americans and the, the many George Floyds, right? The mm -hmm. 435 years of George Floyds uh, and Breonna Taylors and Ahmed Aubrey's and, uh, you know, and, and Natasha McKenna. So in, in seeing that, you know, seeing that happen in Australia, seeing that happening marches in Germany, the fact that we're currently on a call that's happening in South Africa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is literally showing us how he's changing and turning the hearts of people towards truth and towards guidance. And, and a lot of people, even as, as I'm sure many of us have seen that image of the graffiti image of George Floyd in Syria, right? Mm -hmm. This beautiful image where a Syrian refugee painted this image. So what that says is that there are even refugees in Syria who recognize sure. what the militarization of police look like, what oppression looks like, what tyranny, what government tyranny looks like. Right? And so th that's that's really what we're facing. And to be honest, there's a there's a portion that of me that's you know deeply outraged, of course, as a mother, as a Muslim, as a black woman, I'm deeply outraged, and yet that's coupled with a deep sense of hope as I begin to see people standing up and even willing to lay down in the street and say, it's time for you to get your knee off their neck. Absolutely. And you know, sister, speaking about the, in, the militarization of police forces, which has long been a thing of concern for many of us uh, operating within the uh, human rights fields of, of, of America. Um, a few days ago, I sent out, I shared on my Facebook platform, a number of photographs, a number of photographs, not just one or two, a number, at least a half dozen photographs of Israeli police officers mm -hmm. in the same posture, the identical posture as this Chauvin fella in Minneapolis, Minnesota, with mm -hmm. their knees on the throats of a Palestinian uh, mm -hmm. Palestinians, men, old men, older men, younger men, most of them younger men and boys, their knees on their throats. And one of the facts that uh, has been slowly coming to light for many, for far too many have not been aware of this, consciously aware of this, is the fact that there is and has been for a long time a, a very active uh, police training program mm -hmm. in the state of Israel, in apartheid Israel, for mm -hmm. police departments from around the United States. And one of the most active in that program was the Minneapolis, Minnesota Police Department. Yes. Um, Chauvin, uh, who some have uh, uh, expressed, uh, uh, you know, uh, wonderment about uh, whether he, in, in, in fact, is Jewish. And I'm sure that uh, if, if he is Jewish, he is without question a Zionist. Um, and that's not to say that uh, uh, non-Jews cannot be Zionists. I mean, one of the things that our uh, now democratic uh, 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 front runner, well, not, he's no longer a front runner. He's officially the uh, democratic uh, uh, alternative for the presidency. One of the things that he has boasted about in years past that you know, I, I am a, uh, a proud Zionist, uh, Joe mm -hmm. Biden. Uh, so, you know, you don't have to be a Jew to be a, to be a Zionist. But this mm -hmm. individual, uh, Chauvin, who, who's, uh, uh, the charges against him have now been upgraded uh, under the uh, 
a case now uh, uh, that is now with the uh, attorney general for the state of Minnesota, which is, you know, something that uh, days, days uh, at least a, a week ago, you know, right after it happened, we we called for we 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 felt we felt that the, uh, the, the third degree murder charges were were not sufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, they needed to be upgraded and and also it needed to be taken out of the jurisdiction of that local prosecutor mm -hmm. who has a history of of uh, giving uh, a bad police officers and policing a pass but w with all that being said um the, the uh, getting getting back to the internationalization of policing and the militarization of policing mm -hmm. uh, w what are your thoughts on this uh this this trend and that's been going on for a number of years now of police american police being trained in israel and do you see any movement from you know within your circles that this is beginning to receive long overdue attention and some pressure uh, hopefully being brought to bear to end this demonic program your thoughts yeah. It's interesting you mentioned that. Just last year, I had the wonderful opportunity of joining a, a wonderful interfaith delegation uh, of people of faith and people of no faith who were committed to social justice in Israel and in Jerusalem uh, and Palestine. And one thing that was, you know, brought out that was just brought to light was about what we what you're talking about in terms of um, American police officers, you know, from very small, you know, small states, small counties, including in Fairfax, Virginia, who are trained by the IDF. Um, and, and, you know, sadly, this is something that we as Muslims have to become more and more aware of because we also find this policing even inside, I mean, this, this training of G4S contract training happening even in the Muslim world. We have those right. big, training them for what we would consider their TSA officers, um, you know, in terms of, of airport officers, uh, those who are checking. And But what's really important to recognize is that the methodologies that they're using, uh, in particular in peaceful protest, are the same methodologies that were taught to them, and in order for how they're addressing riots that they're, you know, what they're calling uh, many times also peaceful protests, but how they're addressing, um, you know, riots inside of Jerusalem against Israel. And so it is very important to, to recognize that some of these same trainings that are combat trainings, right, that are meant for warfare are being used on innocent civilians. Right. And you know, it even gets even more, you know, more horrid than that, that there's a particular chemical, for example, the tear gas, they're, they're, um, they're, what we call tear gas is a general form. And that's, you know, when you see the police throwing something at the protesters, it releases this smoke, it burns, it agitates the eyes, the throat, and the, na and the nasal passages. So there's, there's a multitude of that they're calling tear gas, but it's not just one substance. And this is important to know because this substance or substances, should I say, have varying degrees of harm. And it's something that the IDF uses um, on innocent civilians, even on children. Sometimes they throw it into their houses and it's something called uh, um, skunk water. And skunk water, what it does is it attaches itself to fabrics or, and it begins to slowly eat away at a fabric. It's, it's, it's called skunk water because it stinks extremely bad. It takes a long time to get away. And it definitely stings the eyes, the nose, the throat, and lasts for a very long time. Now, that skunk water is actually produced in, French, in Maryland. Right, right, that right. And, and yes, that's right. And so these are things that Americans need to become aware of but when it comes to the relationship that we have um, with those who are training our soldiers that are meant to serve and protect and using them against civilian public in a military way as if we are in combat war, we all need to be concerned about this. And it's something that as Muslims, we have got to become more active, more educated about and more active in terms of combating because we're finding these same type of police styles happening all over the Muslim world. Absolutely. And you just brought something to my attention I was not aware of. It shouldn't surprise me that that uh, 
that chemical is being produced in the United States, but right in my backyard in Maryland. Right. SubhanAllah. Sister Aisha, you are in a city that, if I'm not mistaken, has the largest police force in the country. Mm. It is one of the most organized, one of the most militarized, and it is also uh, a police force that has a history of aggression in certain communities. Um, we were just, you and I were just part of a discussion uh, on, fr on Friday night uh, that involved uh, three political officials that seemed to be on the right page in terms of, you know, trying to do something, wanting to do something about, you know, uh, what's happening in their state, on their turf. Um, what, what do you see, uh, what, what do you see as, as, as a real possibility for, uh, for some significant change, uh, with, within, you know, the city of New York, uh, if if not in the entire state, and certainly with 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 the the size of the police force and the influence of the police force in New York, uh, mm -hmm. if significant change did come for the better to New York City to the Big Apple, it would have a ripple effect in different parts of the country. How optimistic are you, sister, that something like this could happen, that we could see some substantive change? Well, let me just say uh, that. Um I have to reference the BDS movement mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about the collaborations, uh, global collaborations with uh, other uh, regimes in the world that oppress their people. And for those and who so, are not familiar, BDS is boycott, divestment, uh, BDS boycott and sanctions mm -hmm. against, uh, you know, apartheid Israel, something mm -hmm. that our brothers and sisters in South Africa know well because it was patterned after the anti-apartheid uh, 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 struggle uh, yes, there. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Go ahead, sister. I'm sorry. So I, I, I just wanted to put that out there because uh, I, I use uh, the South African uh, model, you know, as an example of what it is that we need to do. And it means a total boycott. Uh, Many of us have been invited to come uh, to uh, Israel uh, to participate in programs, all kinds of programs. Uh, many of us have refused to go based on those principles. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I just want to advocate that. That is my position. And I hope that more and more people will sign on to that because we don't need to go to Israel to understand the atrocities that are been that are and that have been and continue to be uh, 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 perpetrated against the Palestinian people. I also like to remind uh, Muslims that uh, this is not just a Palestinian issue, but this is a global Muslim issue. Al Aqsa right. is there. Mm -hmm. You know, if nothing else moves us, we That's should right. be mindful that. Al-Aqsa is our second Qibla. That's right. Right? So just want to bear that in mind and get on record that I support the BDS movement and I'm actively encouraging anybody, you know, with, of any conference to just say, as Mrs. Reagan used to say, just say no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, don't go. Know, yeah. Don't yeah. go. Uh, so, 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 but in New York, you know, I, I'm, I don't think there's, you know, when we talk about reform, we have to be really expecting reform. But if, if, if the reform is just cosmetic, yeah, that yeah. it just allows us to be visible, you know, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we have so many this and that on the force. We have so many this and that from yeah. this faith community. And right. then what do they do once, what are, what are they? We saw the policemen. Uh, push down the old gentleman and when one of them was 
uh, called to assist in a small way, he was uh, prevented from doing that. And what did he do? He didn't say, no, I'm going to help this old man. He, he allowed himself to be pulled away from assisting this man, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm referencing, what is that blue wall, right? Yes. A and how do good cops, you know, if, if we can use that term, how do they fight back, you know? How, because many of them become targets themselves once they do that. Mm -hmm. As we know in the uh, Muslim community, the African-American Muslim community, uh, mm -hmm. the community in general, that when people begin to protest, when they begin to resist, and this is historical fact, when they do that, they become targets, right? Mm -hmm. And their lives are no longer the same. But those are active choices that people make. Now, my mentor is Malcolm X, still. Uh -huh. Yes. And I, uh, I, we Mine have to. Mine as well. We Mine. have to. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it's it's sad that we only appreciate our people after they are dead. But we are taught that the martyr never dies. That's right. And we feel that the words of Malcolm X resonate more profoundly now than they ever did. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. like speaking to us now. So we we. There's no shelter. We, we, we cannot stand on both sides of the fence. You know, we have to take right. positions. And right. there are costs for that. There are costs for that. You know, you don't get the perks. You don't get the tenure and all of the other status that accompanies your compromised integrity. Yeah. Mm. But we call that a good fight. You know, I mean, people actively choose to be ethical. Absolutely. You, and, and, and Sister <laughs> Aisha, on, on that point, be, before I come back to you, Sister Aisha Prime, I want to, because I'm going to, I want, I want you to respond to this question I'm going to put to our sister uh, Aisha Adawi and now uh, in response to what she just raised. One of the things that I have been encouraged by, I've been encouraged by this, but I'm also a bit concerned because of our history. When I say our history, I'm talking about Muslim establishment history. Mm -hmm. There has been a tremendous outpouring of support, of, of verbal support, of statements of support being released by Muslim organizations, large and small. Muslim organizations that put on annual conventions and conferences. Muslim organizations that uh, run mom and pop, a, a kind of humanitarian or civil liberties um, uh, uh, efforts close to home. Uh, you know, just a long litany of, 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 of expressions of concern. We see a lot of our brothers and sisters, uh, Muslims who from, are from other tribes in these demonstrations. Um, and most of them are young. Most of them are young. Um, so we, we have this response. Uh, but getting to the question of the Muslim establishment and, 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 and our integrity around this issue, my hope and my, my prayer is that this is not a flash in the pan because, you know, uh, response, knee-jerk response to something that is, is so uh, in our face nationally and internationally can't be ignored. And, and it's safe. It's safe to release a statement of concern, a statement of, of solidarity. It's, it's safe to participate in a demonstration. It's safe to do one of these uh, online uh, uh, teleconferences. But my, my concern is after all of the dust settles, you know, after all of the hoopla around this uh, fades, what will be what, what will come from our community, our Muslim community, in the days ahead, in, in the way of, you know, work around uh, the, the constant work that's going to be needed to, to usher in much needed reform that will be in the benefit of our entire nation? Your, your thoughts on that, your thoughts on what the Muslim establishment response has been up until now in your hopes, expectations of what will follow in the days ahead? Well, 
I, I have to question what is the Muslim establishment, first and foremost, right? Uh, clearly, it's not sufficient, you know. So, again, we talk about organizations that have prominence, they have visibility, they have a platform, they have funding, right? Uh, yes. To say whatever those things are, right? But yes. we, we, the people on the ground, in the, tr in, in the trenches, the mm -hmm. masses, have to continue to educate ourselves that this is not just an African-American Muslim problem or an African-American problem, but this is a global problem problem and I'm going to reference Malcolm again you know we have to see ourselves in an international setting right mm -hmm. we have we have people all over the world who see us and who hear us right and we mm -hmm. have to embrace that you know um, I I think a lot about uh, how we are saying uh, to some white people you don't speak until we say speak yeah mm -hmm. right and I say, no, no, we, we need all hands on deck. And mm -hmm. those who are really invested in justice, right, right. and human dignity right. will be already uh, in communication with black folks who are yearning to be free, who are yes. fighting for their freedom. They will know when to speak, how to speak. But mm -hmm. we, don't want, we don't want anybody to hesitate to reject bigotry right right we don't don't wait for a cue from anybody right. we know what's right and we know what's wrong so speak up and speak loudly now having said that we are not look there's a cost for doing what you do you know right right i mean so so but many people don't understand that you know they mm -hmm. they feel well you know, I'm working for one agency, one alphabet agency, and so therefore I'm bringing change. So how can you bring change in a system that's already uh, designed to perpetuate itself, right? So mm -hmm. you, you must question this, right? Are you just going to become another agent of the state, you know, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. sent into your own community to assist the brutalization just because you speak the language of the immigrants, you know, mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's not real change, you know, right. but people who are willing to put themselves on the line to say, no, this is wrong, right, even if it's a cost to me. So this, again, becomes the education of, our, of ourselves, myself included, and our community. We have to know the history. We have to know what is factual and what's it, it, what, what is not factual. And it doesn't matter what, what university you went to, how, how many degrees you have, you know, mm -hmm. uh, how much money you have, or where you live, that when white supremacy decides to take you down, they can take you down mm -hmm. because you've already been co-opted mm -hmm. voluntarily. You know, mm -hmm. years ago, there was this song, I'm from the 60s, you know, so mm -hmm. there's this song, Rasan Roland Kirk wrote this song, like three, four words, and what does it say? Volunteered slavery. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are now, where we, we line up to be slaves, you know, to mm -hmm. people who are oppressing not only us, but other people around the world. And, yeah. you know, we have to claim our own role in this as Muslims, locally, nationally, and globally, because eventually we're going to get to our global community as well, because we're not exempt from the madness. Uh, as we said, this is a global pandemic. In That's addition right. to coronavirus, this mm -hmm. white supremacy is global. And it starts with our education and the education of our very young, the colonial mentality, colonial mindset, you know, how do we reach our people? So I'll say education is key, but real education that can allow us the confidence and inshallah, the courage 
to stand up for justice, as that ayah tells us, you know, that's even right. if it's against ourselves, even if it's you know. Against yourself, yeah. Yes. So yeah. that's that's where I like to land, inshallah. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Now, Sister Aisha Prime, you know, I'd like for you to weigh in on that as well, especially given the fact that alhamdulillah, you know, and I and I'm grateful for this. I am personally grateful for the fact that we have a sister like you working with so many young folk. You have access to so many young people um, uh, that you're able to, to influence. You're able to sh uh, 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 um, uh, present as a role model for, alhamdulillah, on, on, on so many levels. You, you, what, do you, what is your thought on, on this challenge that we have um, internally within the Muslim community? To, to, for, for integrity, for, the integ for bringing integrity to the table of, of, of our struggle, um, and uh, just not, in, not simply in the moment, but the integrity of, of, of struggle uh, for, for, uh, uh, for change, uh, for permanent change that will benefit us all, and, and the role that young people are in a position to play in this process. What are your thoughts? Well, the, my thought is that every journey begins with a step. And I say that to say is that when I look at some of the national organizations, I can remember when even, you know, certain conversations were literally taboo to be had. I can remember when, and it wasn't that long ago, that, you know, this even mentioning Black Lives Matter, you know, inside the masjid or talking about, you know, in, even even Trayvon Martin, right? That was like considered, this is a political issue that we're kind of staying away from. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does send one set of people uh, to another set of people as a means to check them. Mm -hmm. And so if there are, you know, and there are two sets of people that have been set to check us, and it has instilled a deep level of fear inside of many, inside of a certain middle class, and I'll talk about that in a minute, that has made them say what Allah says, that if you don't act, right? right? Like if you don't act and stand up for justice, you know, as, as witnesses for Allah, then you could be replaced by another people. And so there is a feeling of, wait a minute, if they can acknowledge the injustices, if the world is starting to pay attention, to the injustices, where am I in that conversation? So there is a certain wake up call to, I, you know, I could be left behind, so let me catch up. I'm not necessarily, my thought is sometimes whatever gets you there, as long as you get there. Right? <laughs> uh, yes. You don't, you know, make the choice to say, to, to be rooted and, and say, I'm gonna dig my heels in and if it's not about Palestine or, you know, Syria or Kashmir, then, then, it, then it's a no-go. I'm actually, you know, if, if it took you a push to get there, well, alhamdulillah, you arrived, you got there. Um, mm -hmm. So we thank Allah for that. And we thank Allah for the progress. I, I think about, for example, some things that I have been invited to to speak, first by the young people at major Islamic organizations, that because the young people were courageous enough to have that conversation, they then said, Sister Aisha, can we bring this to the main stage, right? Mm -hmm. That before it was like, no, hush, hush, hush. Um, mm -hmm. so that's one thing. I, I, you know, every journey begins with the step. Yes. The other thing is, is that when I look at what our young people are doing in, in comparison to, let's say, their parents' generation, there was a deep sense of we have escaped one war, one huge conflict, and we kind of slid in through the radar over here. And they look at, you know, our proximity to power in this, in this structure is going to guarantee our safety, so they thought, is going to guarantee your education, going to guarantee our health care, going to guarantee us a level of peace that we did not enjoy in where we came from. Right, whether they came as forced refugees or they came here be because of a crisis, they arrived. 
And so as a result of that, there's been a certain performing by that particular generation, whether it would be we have to act a certain way, we have to speak a certain way, we have to dress a certain way or not dress a certain way, we have to be educated a certain way. And what's happened with those, that second and third generation is they have begun to be a witness to the crack in that. They have begun to be a witness to say, wait a minute, especially when they start looking at the statistics of Islamophobia. And they start to say, you know what? I'm realizing that this performance that we're doing is not necessarily giving us a proximity to power like we thought it was going to. That it is not necessarily, gain, it may you know, gain us safety for a moment, but what we have to do, what we're compromising of ourselves in order to achieve it, mom and dad, I'm just not with it. Right? And literally, they are, they are digging in their heels in terms of their own desire for authenticity. Because they're saying, mom and dad, I think that if you chose to be in proximity to power, for most, again, in some cases, well-intentioned, if they chose to be in proximity to power because there was a belief in the lies that they were told, as El Haj Malik Shabazz said, if you're not careful, the media will have you, will have you hating those who are oppressed while loving those who are doing the oppressing. Yeah. And so they didn't realize that they were being hoodwinked. Trick, let astray, run them up. They didn't realize it. They didn't know. You know, they, they believe what the what the news was telling them. They told them they they told them it was the land of the free and the home of the brave. And as long as you had a good, strong work ethic, you could pull yourself up off your bootstraps. But then, especially for those of darkest skin uh, complexion, immigrated, okay. their, their children begin to have a different experience. And so their children begin to say, uh, "Mama and Dad, it turns out I'm black. Turns out we all black, right? And turns out my life matters." And so that begins to say, in terms of um, this performance, to speak like them, dress like them, behave like them, I'm not doing it. I, I, it doesn't feel authentic, authentic to me. And therefore, my expression for how Islam will be is, is, is a methodology of social justice. And that, that instills in us a deep sense of fear. It begins to shape you know, that generational divide deep into their core. But one thing they care more about, and I give them this, they care more about uh, than proximity to power is proximity to their families. And the fear of losing their children caused them to say, let me issue a statement, let me hold a forum, let me, uh, let me open the doors, let me hold a conference. And so that if their children was a means of opening their eyes, and, and if, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose their children to be the iron, you know, to, uh, to be the iron rod that opened up their hearts, well, alhamdulillah, at least they were open to something. I don't know if, uh, if you all are experiencing some 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 problems, some technical difficulties with our, with the sound and, and even the video is going in and out. Mm -hmm. um, let uh, I can hear. I can see. I'm you. not hearing anything right now, uh, and I'm not hearing anything from our sister Aisha. I'm not. Uh, I wasn't and, and your, uh, your, <laughs> your video is frozen. Really? Yes. Uh oh, Brother Maury is out. Yeah, Sister, we'll give him a yes, darling. No, I was oh. gonna. Say, I can. I can hear you clearly. I can see you, and I can hear you the clearly same. now. <laughs> Such an honor to share this, this panel discussion with you. You know, um, I thought that by now I would be somewhere off near a waterfall, <laughs> contemplating, <laughs> reflecting. Maybe writing, yes. you know, but <laughs> maybe it's not time yet. Now we are. Okay, well, we alhamdulillah, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> let, I'm, I'm so happy that this, it, 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 this has uh, start, it, it began to happen, you know, just after three o'clock. Uh, and uh, I don't know if it's because of my connection on this end or if I, I don't know if, if it's oh, well, it we know. with you all as well. <laughs> Uh, you are coming in and out, but, but but that's okay. Again, Whatever you, it is, you, got, you guys are frozen. Oh, okay. Subhanallah. That's okay. We know. <laughs> okay. We can um, and we can hear each other. Yeah, <laughs> we can like see each other. Is trying to, to to speak, but both of you are frozen. Uh, is Ibrahim around, our brother? 
Aisha, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Okay. I can hear you fine. I can uh, see you fine. And mm -hmm. so I'm doing that. I just, you know, I'm grateful that you're still around to guide us in this struggle. I know that um, we definitely need you as you were talking about, you know, the importance of having, uh, you know, um, someone basically who's, who's advising in this process. And particularly even just things that you've said today, I've benefited from greatly. You know, I think about uh, it takes all of us when we looked at the abolition movement Right. It took it took older generations, took younger generations. It took white folks. It took, of course, obviously it took us to be able to stand up for our own struggle and say this is how we're going to lead this struggle. But we definitely needed their voices um, and they were, you know, they were necessary. And so the fact that, you know, so many people are waking up, I, you know, what are your thoughts about uh, El Haj Malik Shabazz wanted to bring the bring up, bring the U.S. up on charges to the U.N.? I said to my husband this morning, I said, well, now would be the time. Now, <laughs> because the, the world is ready now. Well, I hope so, my dear. You know, because, again, we see, we see uh, people still shucking and jiving, as we used mm -hmm. to say, you know. Because, again, there are, there are prices to be paid, you know, for not uh, behaving, you know, uh, for sassing as we used to say in the South, when you talk back to white people, you know. So there's a cost for that. But again, I say that's a good fight, you know, and you want to always try to stand in integrity. And we're not, we don't always do it. Sometimes we slip, sometimes we fall, but we have to always keep our eyes on the prize, you know, as one of our brothers said. So that's what we have to do, and we have to continue to struggle. I support the idea of uh, opening up spaces for young people because that's what we have to do. And, you know, I, at 76 years old, clearly, you know, I'm on the other side of the spectrum, you know. Uh, so I'm grateful that you're there. Uh, I'm very passionate about uh, uh, traditional uh, learning. And to have you there, it's really very important because, again, most of us don't have any idea and we are witnessing that in many instances, our young people don't even care to know. So to find a way to communicate with them, to engage them, so that they have a firm grounding of what that is. It's not something, you know, antiquated and set in stone, you know, that nobody can access unless they go somewhere and live in the desert forever and never come away. But so this is very important for young people to have access to this knowledge so that when they step out, they're grounded and they are able uh, to stand, you know, for what's right. So I, I honor you and I'm very happy that you're there. And oh, you too, brother. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. I, I honor you. I honor you. Yeah, and I, you know, these days, I don't. I don't look forward to them going overseas and doing it. That's why I said we did that so you didn't have to, right? So we could bring it right to you, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. I still like to have those opportunities, though, for women to be able to delve mm -hmm. in that uh, rich well. You know, yeah, yeah. for our own uh, healing as well as mm -hmm. uh, bringing that forward. You know, to our community when we return to wherever we come from. So I advocate for that. I also advocate that we have to uh, be not only willing, but actively recruiting, uh, pursuing women, uh, mm -hmm. because women are key in this struggle for liberation. And we have to come to an understanding that That's this right. is in fact our reality. And so to, to, to make the space uh, to create the environment that makes it easier for women to come forward and, you know, help lead the struggle for liberation because women are doing it anyway to great, to great disadvantage to themselves and their communities. I mean, you know, it's just happening. So we have to make it easier for women to do the work that they do, especially in peace building. Women are at the forefront of this, you know. So let's let's open up the ways for women to enter this and to stand 
in integrity, in strong power, and lead our communities uh, again to liberation. I love this word because it's not just freedom, but liberation, you know. Sister is comprehensive. No, yes. I'm so happy you're back, brother. Oh, brother. Well, <laughs> well uh, and, I, and I hope I'm back long enough uh, to, to be able to, to wrap this up, inshallah ta'ala, in a... Uh, in, in, a, uh, uh, in, a, in a professional way. <laughs> my, uh, uh, th this is my first time. You're always actually, professional, brother. You're always professional. I am, this is my first time using this, my handheld device to, to try to do this. I, I, I learned over the past week uh, or so that uh, the internet provider that I had uh, uh, for uh, up until now, has been, it's been very weak. So I just ordered a new one that's going to be stronger, and inshallah ta'ala we'll be able to draw um, next week from my laptop as I had been able to do be before this. But in, in wrapping up, what I want to do is this: we didn't get a chance to get into the COVID nineteen pandemic and its impact on the African American community and how it is also affecting Muslims. What I want to do is. Uh, 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 in, in these final moments is get uh, allow both of you to share some final thoughts um, along the lines of and, and this can be whatever you 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 feel that you, you are so passionate about that you you and, and and so concerned about that you want to end with you want to end this program with i want your perspectives on the challenges and opportunities confronting muslims in america uh, again, given our size, diversity, material capacity, where we are as uh, within this nation of nations vis-a-vis -vis this global pandemic, um, you know, Sheikh, I had Sheikh Abdullah Hakim quick with uh -huh. me last Sunday. And uh -huh. uh, I don't know if you saw the video that he did um, about three weeks ago, a short video, very powerful, where he spoke about this, glo this global pandemic and the fact that it represents a reset for humanity, an opportunity mm -hmm. for a reset. Um, uh, we, we talked a, a, a bit about that. So, you know, in your, in your closing remarks, whatever you, you feel the need to address within the scope of the challenges and, and opportunities facing us uh, mm -hmm. here in this country. Um, your thoughts on this opportunity also for a reset in the wake of this pandemic and mm -hmm. what the kinds of isolation that it has forced upon us and and no doubt the the the, the, the thinking the, uh, uh, about how we up until now have conducted our lives those of mm -hmm. us who are religious those of us who are non-religious and again, the opportunity for a reset. Let's begin with our sister Aisha El Adawiya, and then we're going to conclude with you, sister Aisha okay. Prime. Yes. Sir. Well, alhamdulillah. Uh, it so happened that uh, Ramadan came just in time in the midst of this pandemic yes, uh, and, and gave us an oppor a, a real opportunity to reset. Uh, I want to acknowledge and uh, appreciate all of the frontline workers uh, in the medical profession uh, on down to the delivery person, yes. every person who has made it possible for us to shelter in place, you know. Mm -hmm. They have become our heroes and our sheroes, you know. Mm -hmm. So I hope that we don't forget them after this Absolutely. is over because yes. they are letting us see that, again, they are vital, they are human beings, they are our sisters and brothers, and they are taking risks for us in making sure that we're able to do the things that we're asked to do. So I want to uh, give a shout out uh, to them. Yes. We noticed that many of the medical professionals are actually Muslims. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, I hope that we can appreciate yes. this after we get you know, back to some semblance of what we may call the new normal, but that's going to be necessary. And I caution us because after 9-11, after 9-11, I thought, wow, that was a, another great reset opportunity. But we went to sleep again, you see. So I hope that we don't allow ourselves and those around us and those that we care for 
to go to sleep again because it's just too important. And as we see, our brothers and our sisters are being sacrificed right before our eyes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have six boys in my family, young boys, a grandson and four or five great grandsons. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, this has to stop, you know. So, again, yes. I'm hoping that uh, all of the people who are suffering from this pandemic will see it as an opportunity uh, to grow, uh, to go inward and deepen our spirituality, whatever we uh, call that, so that we come out anew, right, refreshed to do God's work, which is really what we are called to do. So we will suffer, but we ultimately understand and believe that Allah will bring us through this too. So it, growing up as a Christian, uh, there you, you, you saying that says, we know that God did not bring us this far mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to leave to us leave now. Us That's right. So we <laughs> are resolute in our resistance and our hope. So as we vacillate between rage and hope, Inshallah, Allah will provide the means for us to continue and live ethical, wholesome lives. Inshallah. Amen. Amen. Sister Aisha Prime, your thoughts, closing thoughts. You know, in looking at the situation with COVID-19, you know, I'm so grateful that you talked about Sheikh Abdul Hakim quit because in that video where he talked about what, how 20, you know, how 2020 began. You know, we look at 2020 vision is the vision of the time when I can see quite clearly. And he talked about the, what has, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made clear for us without doubt, unequivocally, is that we are in a time where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is seemingly giving us, if not the last chance, one of the close to it. In the fact that he has sent plague upon plague upon national disaster. And when it came to COVID-19, it was a real wake up call. But even if we weren't getting it before George Floyd, what was happening with COVID-19 is we began to become a witness to medical apartheid. We began to become a witness to the great disparage, the, you know, the great uh, divide between the have and the have nots. Because even though African Americans are only 12%, supposedly 12% of the American population, they were between 21 to 23% of those who were contracting the disease. They were between five to seven times more likely to die from the disease depending on what state that you were in. So when we talk about five to seven times more likely to die, is it because there's a problem in there, you know, with the melanin in their skin? Absolutely not. They're five to more seven times to die from the virus because of the way that they are treated in the hospitals, because they were not receiving the same, they weren't receiving the same level of care. They weren't receiving before they entered the hospitals, right? Which led to a multitude of sicknesses um, inside the African American community. And then when they arrived in the hospitals, if they were able to have the insurance to do so, when they arrived, they did not receive the same level of care. And then as a result, are dying at an, at an alarming rate. And the interesting thing about it, those who caught it were 70% likely to die from it. That as opposed to others who are only between 30 to 40% likely to die from it. This speaks to something, something is, 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 a, is amiss. Mm -hmm. And so if we weren't aware of the stacking bodies, right? If the Muslim community thought that they could ignore it, what happened in the Muslim communities is the Muslim bodies were stacking up so much to the point that they didn't have enough people in order to pray to, in order to perform the proper whistles in order to, to, to handle the bodies properly, in order for them to get a proper janaza. So there was no way for the Muslim community to be to ignore this problem because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally brought it to our front door. And then it was like, okay, now you're becoming relaxed because you're in Ramadan, you're in your home, mashallah, may Allah bless and reward you. But don't forget that as you're saying, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah to your right and to your left, when you're finishing those prayers at night, you still gotta get up and stand up for justice. Right? There's still there's still bodies stacking up. 
And so immediately after Ramadan, we had our Eid. We thought, yay, we're happy. And as our sister Aisha said, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, don't you think you're going to sleep? Don't you think, you know, the, the places are going to start opening up. You're going to have an Eid party and that's going to be the end of it. And then subhanAllah, this happened to our brother George Floyd. And even while the protests were going on with George Floyd, there were more bodies stacking up. There were bodies stacking up in, in Louisiana, stacking up in Louisville, Kentucky. Many more people continued to die. And as you mentioned, someone else um, being assaulted or mistreated. So the, the reality of the situation is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put the opportunity at our doorstep. And I would like to say about two to three things that Allah Ta'ala is saying. Number one, it's time for us to recognize and repent. That's the first thing. Recognize where we have fallen short as a, individually and as a community. And, and repent is not only, oh Allah, I'm sorry. Repentance is to turn around. So I have been going in the wrong direction. I need to stop, turn around, and rectify my affairs. That's the first thing we have to do. And then we need to collectively come together and work towards some very concrete solutions. And as we're, you know, since we're uh, advertising this or having this moment inside of South Africa, Africa is in, a, is in a unique opportunity because there are many people who are saying, you know what, I've invested my talent, my resources, my education in this. You know, maybe it's time for the Abyssinia migration. Maybe it's time for that first hijrah. So I can pick up those lessons, right, in order to come back and establish a Medina. But first, let me do that first hijrah, that first migration. And so Africa needs to look at just as al Haj Malik Shabazz called for the Organization of African Unity and said, listen, there's an injustice happening. And many of you are Muslims. It's time for you to welcome your sons and daughters, your granddaughters and your grandsons back home and allow them to use their talent, their resources and their education in order to rebuild. That's, an, that's what opportunity, that's one opportunity that lays before us. And the other one is that once we get strong and we galvanize and we're very clear because we could burn it down, we could loot it. And then we say, okay, now what do we have in order to replace it, right? What system have we built in order and, and that we you know, are ready to lay that out? Each one of us has given, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given each one of us a talent, a skill, something, and it's not, it's not everybody's going to be a political activist, right? Not everyone's going to be a public speaker. I remember one of the greatest things about the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa was the artist that came out, how it became a part of, of, of culture, how they, and, and culture is a, is a method of huge change. So we mm -hmm. literally, everyone from the artist to the activist, from the scholars, to you know, and to the teachers, we need everyone. All we need, all hands on deck, in order to do a full overhaul of the system of white supremacy, because that is an overhaul for this world. May Allah Taala grant us tawfiq and afia in doing that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, sister, um, uh, we're, we're as I close this, <laughs> this, this energizing this thought provoking and energizing conversation down i want to say to those of uh, uh of our audience not familiar with our sister aisha prime she is known uh, for her eloquent supplications so mm. my sister i want mm. you yeah. please to give us a a fitting supplication a closing supplication for this program inshallah ta'ala and um and if you uh, if you if you do so in Arabic uh, for the benefit of uh, those of us who are not fluent in the language as you are, give us the translation as well, inshallah ta'ala, please. I'll just do it. How about I do it in English? Is that okay? Okay, that's good. That's good. <laughs> if they're Arabic listeners, I'll I'll do I'll do that in Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rumbil Anameen Musanat Musanam and a Sahidina Munana Muhammad and Wana Ali Sahidina Munan Muhammad. Ya Allah, all praise are due to you. Ya Rabbi, we send salutations of peace and blessings upon our master teacher, the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you give us a complete and perfect faith after which there is no disbelief. Give us a certainty in you after which there is no doubt, no hypocrisy that gives us the courage to move forward upon your path, the straight path that leads to liberation. Ya Allah, we ask that you please grant us liberation just as you granted Musa and his people. Ya Rabbi, we ask 
you grant us a manifest victory just as you granted the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please give us the resources, Ya Rabbi, as you gave to Sulaiman, Ya Rabbi, and as we are in the fire, Ya Rabbi, of this struggle, we ask that you bless it to be cool and safe for us as you did for Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam. Ya Rabbi, we ask you by your mercy that you expand our hearts and that you fill it with knowledge from you. Ya Rabbi, give us a light from your light, a knowledge from your knowledge. Ya Rabbi, give us an honor from your honor, a dignity from your dignity, Ya Allah. Ya Al Muhammad, the one who protects. We ask that you please build the fortress of your protection around us, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you protect us from the enemies of you and the enemies of us. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please push our enemies far back from us as far as the north is from the south. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please guide them or remove them from our life. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please reach into their hearts and that you turn them toward right action, Ya Rabbi, even despite their own selves. Ya Rabbi, Amen. make us a means of guidance for others, a means of light for others, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, make us a means of benefit to others, Ya Arham Rahimin. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please bless our teachers, bless our activists, bless and protect those who are on this path. Give them health and well-being. Give them strength and certitude. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you bless them to be guided in every moment. Make us amongst those who have hearts that are guided aright. Ya Rabbi, bless us amongst those who have steps that are sure, that are firm upon the path that you're, which you're well pleased. Allah, we ask that when the moment of death comes for the angel to come and take our soul, bless them to take it when you're pleased with us. Bless them to take it, Ya Rabbi, when our tongues are on La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Rabbi, and resurrect us upon truth. Resurrect us upon your, your look of pleasure. Resurrect us upon La ilaha illallah resurrect us upon that which was courageous and that which was true and that which was justice. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala sayyidina mulana muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen alakuma ameen 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 brothers and sisters uh, I want to thank you for joining us uh, please uh, share this video with as uh, as many of your friends and your neighbors as you possibly can. I want to thank Allah Ta'ala for both of these outstanding sisters. I want to thank Allah for uh, uh, introducing them into my life. I want mm. to thank Allah Ta'ala for blessing uh, me to have uh, friends in South Africa, like our friends at Salaam Media, for them extending the invitation to their brother Salah Khan to join their platform. And uh, we ask Allah Ta'ala to to guide us and, and, and to preserve us in all of our endeavors of good and to bless us to die not except in a state of Islam. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wal Asr. Inna al insana la fi kusr. Illa ladina amanu amalu salihati. Wa tawasa bil haq. Wa tawasa bil sabr. Which means, in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, uh, by the token of time through the ages, verily humanity is in loss except those who believe and do good and exhort one another to truth and exhort one another to patiently persevere. And mean brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. thank you for joining us. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll so see much. you for the next week's edition That's of A show. Conversation with El Haj Maurice Salakan. May Allah bless my sisters. Thank you so much. alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah.